Welcome to a Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a new series on themes in the Gospel of John. Not just straight through John, themes in the Gospel of John. This is lesson number one in that series for October 5 of 2024. And we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we look once again into your activities when you came here to this earth to teach us about the Father and about how things work in heaven and so many things that seem so contrary to what happens here on this earth. Help us to understand these matters so we may go, grow closer to you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, you know, if you get a letter from somebody, you want to know who wrote it, and why did they write it, and so forth. So why did John write his gospel? What were the circumstances? John focuses on just a few miracles in his gospel. They're not nearly as many as they are in some of the other gospels. They were almost all performed on the Sabbath, and you know that was a problem. He then chose to connect those miracles with the kind of power Jesus exercised and what his relationship to God was. Would that be enough to convince you that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God? Jim, you want to take on John 20 there? Yeah, John 20, verses 30 and 31. In his disciples' presence, Jesus performed many other miracles which were not written down in this book. But these have been written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in him you may have, have life from the American Bible Society. Okay, <laughs> this is one of the first proofs that we're not just going to the gospel from beginning to end because they're starting out at the very end, <laughs> almost the very end. It says that you may believe, and I went through my, I got my RSV, and man, many times, each, I don't know how many of there, maybe 30 yeah, or times. That we'll talk believe. about there. There's more than 100 times yeah. that you may believe. Yeah. We have just studied in our previous section of a series of lessons, the Gospel of Mark, and we discovered that much of Mark's Gospel was for the purpose of convincing us that Jesus was the Messiah. Which Gospel do you enjoy studying the most, and why? And I will have to be honest, I think I prefer John, although I'll tell you, I have a hard time leaving Mark, I mean, leaving Mark out or leaving Luke out or leaving Matthew mm -hmm. out, so. Why is John's Gospel so different from the other three Gospels? Now, I think we better get into this. Why do you think it's so different? Because it was written much later for a different reason. Okay, written much later. The other three Gospels were written in the 60s AD, as far as we can tell. John was not written until the 90s AD. And what had happened between the 60s and the 90s AD? Jerusalem had been destroyed, yeah. the temple had been destroyed. The temple of Jerusalem had destroyed, the Jews had been scattered around the world. Um, there were Christians in a number of places and scattered around the Mediterranean at that point. How sure we are of those dates? The Pretty certain. From the uh, Peter, um, who was responsible for the Gospel of Mark, was crucified in 67. Okay. Paul was crucified in 67. We can tell that because of the relationship to Nero. Yeah, yeah external. Yeah, evidence. from other sources. Yeah, so pretty, pretty certain of those dates. So how was, you said Mark and John were both to convince us that Jesus was the Messiah. So how are they different? Well, Mark will go through and he just says miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And he sort of lets you draw your own conclusions. And we're going to see when we look at John, he's going to say, here's a miracle, but what do we need to learn from that miracle? So that's probably the biggest difference between John and Mark. Is John going to tell us what, what we need to learn from that miracle? <laughs> In some cases. Or did he, I should say? Yeah. Did he tell us? Yes. So I want you to think about this all through this lesson, maybe all through this quarter. What are the most important, is or are the most important things that convince you that Jesus is or was the Messiah Christ, the Son of God? And now you all know, I'm sure, that Messiah is Hebrew and Christ is Greek for the same word. It means the Anointed One. 
and that could have been applied to a high, the high priests were anointed, the, most of the kings were anointed, so um, technically they were messiahs or Christ in the strictly legal meaning, or strictly literal meaning of that term. John's Gospel was written about 30 years after the other Gospels, as we mentioned. It was written at a time when John was the only disciple still alive. Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Romans, and the Jews were scattered all over the Mediterranean world, and many of them were in slavery. Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, this is another probably really important point. Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, had become essentially a dead language. Did John feel more free to talk about major issues because of those things? John was living in Ephesus among a small community of Christian believers. They were in contact with other communities of believers in nearby cities of Asia Minor. So we have a city of um, 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 Ephesus, a significant Christian community, that we're reaching out to other cities around there in that area. And that's about where we were. So just to be clear, so this is John the Revelator? Or? Yes. Okay. So then John, when did he go to Patmos? Before this. Before? Before he wrote this. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty good evidence. Well, okay, so he was in Ephesus after he, he was in that, No, he was in Ephesus off and on for quite a bit earlier. Then he was arrested. They tried to kill him by throwing him in a pot of burning of boiling oil. It didn't work. They took him out. They sent him to Patmos. And then the Caesar changed, and it was a completely opposing group of Caesars. And so they said, all you people who are in there for political reasons, you can go free. And then Paul was allowed to go free and went back to Ephesus. And that's when he wrote Paul. John. And John. John. I'm sorry, John. I'm sorry. John went back to Ephesus. Yeah, and that's apparently, uh, John had taken uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, there. Yes. To, to Ephesus. And he, and she, we're pretty sure she died there. Uh, John also died there eventually, but so he, he. So she was older. Mary would have, would have been older than John. Yes. Quite a bit. Mm, probably yeah. not quite a bit. Okay. She was probably a teenager when she married right. Joseph, and so. And John certainly was already born at that time, so. Was John younger than Jesus? Yes. Okay, so. Yeah. So Mary was probably at least 15, 20 years older. Yeah, significantly older. Mm -hmm. Well, um, John makes some very, very important statements about truths that are foundational to our understanding of the gospel message. Is that because he had years of interaction with believers to think about what was really important? Think about John would be traveling around, he would be trying to establish church groups, and he would be going back to churches that had already been established and trying to, you know, help them get straightened out and so forth. Well, the other gospel writers had 30 years to think about it. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. John had twice John as long. just had more. Twice as long. Yeah. And a changing world. Yes. And John's gospel, here's something important. John's gospel is the most chronologically detailed of any of the gospels. While, we, while he focused on events that happened mostly in Jerusalem, he gave us enough chronological information to put together most of the details of the three and a half years of ministry of Jesus. None of the other Gospels give us those details. It's another thing that was different about John. And so, and maybe he felt like that was important to include in his Gospel since he was the last one writing, perhaps. Well, in this lesson, we will look at three of Jesus' earliest miracles and then look at several miracles performed on the Sabbath, done at least partially to confront the Jewish leaders' view of the Sabbath. Larry, would you be able to take that one, next one there? Okay, from the Bible study guide for October 28. John calls these miracles signs, quote unquote. He does not mean something like a street sign, but rather a miraculous event that points toward a deeper reality. Jesus as the Messiah. In all these accounts, we see examples of people who responded by faith and their examples invite us to do the same. So John has a very specific reason for including what he does and saying what he does about those miracles. 
Before reading the Gospel of John, the only earlier parts of the ministry of Jesus that we know about are the ministry of Jesus. Now, we're talking about his baptism, the 40 days of fasting, prayer, and temptations from the devil, and three, Jesus returned to the place where John was baptizing. After John had pointed out Jesus as the Lamb of God, some of John's disciples <laughs> began to follow Jesus. Now, those are things that are just generally known. James and John may have been the cousins of Jesus. I won't go into the details of that, but if you look at the names of the women who are around the cross at the end and there at the resurrection, it looks like one of those ladies was the mother of James and John. And there you can make a sort of a yeah. connection there. Um, John may have been the first disciple to decide to follow Jesus, even before John the Baptist encouraged them to do so. Consider these very interesting details from the writing of Ellen White. Lorna? He, Jesus, had been separated from his mother for quite a length of time. During this period, he had been baptized by John and had endured the temptations in the wilderness. Rumors had reached Mary concerning her son and his sufferings. John, one of the new disciples, had searched for Christ and had found him in his humiliation, emaciated and bearing the marks of great physical and mental distress. Now that would be during the times of his 40 days of, so John was out there looking for him. Yeah. Jesus, unwilling that John should witness his humiliation, had gently yet firmly dismissed him from his presence. He wished to be alone. No human eye must behold his agony. No human heart be called out in sympathy with his distress. The disciple had sought Mary in her home and related to her the incidents of this meeting with Jesus as well as the event of his baptism when the voice of God was heard in acknowledgement of his son. And the prophet John had pointed to Christ saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. For 30 years, this woman had been treasuring up evidences that Jesus was the Son of God, the promised Savior of the world. Joseph was dead, and she had no one in whom to confide the cherished thoughts of her heart. She had fluctuated between hope and perplexing doubts, but always feeling more or less of an assurance that her son was indeed the promised one. Wow. <clears throat> That's from a series of books called The Spirit of Prophecy. If you had an, haven't had an opportunity to read those, you'll find them very, very interesting. So what the sick BR, what does that stand for? British spelling. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That Ellen White used for the, right. for the word yeah. Savior. Okay. Turning to Jesus' attendance at the wedding at Cana and his first miracle, we read in John 2, 111. Mickey, you want to read that for us? Two days later, after Jesus' initial call of the first five disciples to be with him part-time, there was a wedding in the town of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to this wedding. When the wine had given out, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine left. I'm going, to, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Why do you suppose Mary said that to Jesus? I would speculate she was anxious for him to manifest himself. Okay, I, I agree with that, but I think there may be another reason that's even more profound. Well, I've heard embarrassment. Heard a couple others. She was he, maybe involved. Had connections. She was involved with the wedding preparations, maybe, and so... Yeah, I think that's partly too. And Jesus had always been the one that she'd gone to. Yeah, I think that's probably the main thing. She was just saying, <laughs> if there's got a problem, talk to Jesus. He's, he's going he's gonna to help us. Okay, go ahead. You must not tell me what to do, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. Jesus' mother then told the servants, do whatever he tells you. The Jews have rules about ritual washing, and for this purpose, six stone water jars were there, each one large enough to hold about a hundred liters. Okay, so all you mathematicians who are used to these different methods, how much is a hundred liters? Divided uh -huh. by four, so four. that many gallons, 25 gallons. Yeah. Roughly five gallons, like, yeah. A little bit more than that, actually. Yeah, liters, a little different accord. Yeah. yeah. 
not, not by yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Jesus said to his the servants, "Fill these jars with water." Okay, so and these were used. There were six for of them. Washing hands. They were used. They were, well, not just washing hands. They were used for because you you had to wash all kinds of stuff. If you came from the marketplace, something might have been touched by a Gentile. But this implies that they were empty because they had to fill it with water. Yeah, right. So why were they there empty if they were supposed well, to be there for washing? Well, because they were kept by the front door, probably, or maybe just outside their front door. Because every time you go to the market, you got to, you say, why were they empty? Yeah. Yeah, that would be a good question. Yeah. Obviously, for they were washed when they'd come in. <laughs> yeah, but these are, you know, 100 liter jars. So you're not going to use all that for just a little bit of feet washing and so forth. But it just seems odd that they were, all of them were apparently empty. Yeah. Yeah. So were they extra then, or could have been extra ones? I don't know. Those, that's possible too. Okay, and they filled yeah. them to the brim? Okay, so they, they filled them to the brim, and then he told them, now draw some water out and take it to the man in charge of the feast. They took him the water, which had now turned into wine, and he tasted it. He did not know where this wine had come from, but of course the servants who had drawn out the water knew. So he called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone else serves the best wine first, and after the guests have had plenty to drink, he serves the ordinary wine. But you have kept the best wine until now. Jesus performed this, this first miracle in Cana in Galilee, and there he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Okay. Is that the reason why he did this disciples, so his <laughs> disciples would believe in him? That was part of the reason. Yeah, part. Yeah. But John others, seemed to think so. that were there. Yeah. It's interesting to notice, well, no doubt this was the freshest grape juice they had ever tasted. They were beginning to see that Jesus could not only influence the lives of people, but he also could control nature. That's a significant point. The Greek term oinos in this passage is used both for both fresh, is used, I'm sorry, both for fresh and fermented grape juice. Myra? Yes, from Desire of Ages. The wine which Christ provided for the feast and that which he gave to the disciples as the symbol of his own blood was the pure juice of the grape. To this, the disciple Isaiah refers when he speaks of the new wine in a cluster, in the cluster, and says, destroy not it not, for a blessing is in it. Isaiah 65, 8. Okay. Why do you think Jesus chose the setting of a wedding as the place for his first miracle? Well, do we want to say anything about the... I, I, I don't know what the main Christian world believes if that was grape juice or wine. Well, that's influenced by their... I mean... Obviously, this Greek word, what they did is they would squeeze the grape juice, and that would usually, they usually did that with their feet, and they would collect this stuff, and then they would start, there was no refrigeration, so... It didn't it, stay fresh very long. No, it didn't stay fresh but very it's long, that's right. As, as raisins, and then make, make wine. Well, sometimes they would store it, dry it out, store it as raisins, and then make wine out of the uh, grape juice, if, or the raisin juice, if you will. They also did that. Why, Perhaps not as, as tasty as uh, fresh bread. Yeah, I no. think it was Samson who was they advised to not even give him raisins, right? Yeah. So, well, some people insist because it wouldn't have kept very long that they, drinking wine was an everyday sort of thing. Of course, naturally fermentation, wouldn't that turn to vinegar or something? Or, no. Uh, or, or it may have to be if, done if you right. Leave it, Depending on what kind of organism is in there, it could, yeah. Um, but obviously they had ways of trying to, I mean, other people have found ways to try to produce only alcohol and not, mm. and not vinegar. So this particular, quote, wine, end quote, was a few minutes old. <laughs> yeah. so it was fresh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So... Gordon, I guess you're next. From the Bible Study Guide. For his first miracle, Jesus could have chosen to perform a spectacular resurrection from the dead, 
before a big crowd of Jewish leaders and dignitaries, but instead he chose a simple gathering in a small town and met its humble people where they were in their, in their everyday activities. Now, if you think about the story of Christ's life, his ministry, he did perform one of those miracles, raised somebody from the dead, and he knew a few months later he would be dead. Yeah. So that might be a good reason why he didn't start out with that kind of a... Well, so. Remember, uh, the, the Lazarus, the, the story of rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man says, uh, I got five brothers, warn them so that they don't end up in this place. And, uh, but it, it had no positive influence on him when, when he raises Lazarus, the real Lazarus, yeah. they plotted to kill Jesus. And, and first Lazarus. of all, tried to kill Lazarus, and then they went ahead and killed Jesus. Mm -hmm. Our Bible study guide goes on, seeing Jesus perform the miracle of changing the water into wine provided evidence in favor of the disciples' decision to follow Jesus. In the custom of those days, you followed someone, well, you, you had to beg permission to join the group of the follows a rabbi. Because if you get to that level, uh, you start off at primary school, you're expected to memorize the entire books of Moses, memorized in Hebrew by the time you finished primary school. If you, got on, if you did that, did it successfully and well, you could go on to a secondary school and you're expected to ex memorize the rest of the Old Testament. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, these people should have known the Bible very, very well. So I'm still, not in, pri I'm still in primary school, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But that was just memorization without really understanding the intent. Many cases, yeah. yes. Well, I'm sure they debated the meaning. Yeah. Well, by the time... Different schools see, had different thoughts, yeah, probably. Yeah. Anyway, uh, how could it not have been a powerful sign pointing to him as being someone from God? They probably were not yet ready to understand that he was God. I mean, you know, you see somebody walking around in ordinary clothes, dusty, dirty, ordinary sandals, dirty feet, and someone says to you, did you know that's God? <laughs> I mean, what do you, <laughs> you know, it might take you a few rounds. Well, knowing, if ever. <laughs> knowing him as a kid, yeah. knowing where he was born, so that, you know, those yeah. would be logical questions. The devil has been doing everything he can to destroy human marriages almost from the days of the Garden of Eden. He understands how crucial marriages are to God's plan. When we enter the kingdom of heaven, we will be expected to live in harmony with all kinds of people from all cultures and all time periods. One of the most important things that we need to learn from marriage is how to get along with at least one other person who does not see things the same as we do Marriage is a warm-up for heaven. <laughs> so let's, I, let's hope it's a heavenly experience. So I believe that, you know, the, the marriage and the male, or the male and the female yeah. are complementary views of God. Yes. And, yes. you know, facets. But, come on, did you have to make it that different? <laughs> you know? Yeah, the, okay. And it's, it's like... You're, well, how much? Uh, yeah, if you can figure it out, if you figure it out, then you've really accomplished something. There's a, a book by Eli Siegel. Anyway, the, all reality is a oneness of opposites. Yeah. What I learned about 40 yeah. years ago, well, 30 years ago. If you think that we are very opposite from the two different sexes, what's going to happen when we get to heaven? There's people there from every time period, every nation in the world. There's going to be yeah, lots of people well, from this earth and yeah. from other worlds. Yeah. 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 Jim, you got... From Ellen White, Jesus saw in every soul one to whom must be given the call to his kingdom. He reached the hearts of the people by going among them as one who desired their good. He sought them in the public streets, in private houses, and on boats, in the synagogue, by the shores of the lake, and at the marriage feast. He met them at, the daily, at their daily vocations and manifested an interest in their secular affairs. He carried his instruction into the household, bringing families in their own homes under the influence of his divine presence. His strong, 
personal sympathy helped to win hearts. He often repaired to the mountains for solitary prayer, but this was a preparation for his labor among men in active life. From these reasons, Season. he came forth to relieve the sick, to instruct the ignorant, and to break the chains of the captives of, of Satan. Ellen White, Desire of Ages 151. Okay, so talk about a little more history. Larry? Okay, from the Bible Study Guide. God promised, uh, prophesied through Moses that the prophet would come who was like Moses. God asked Israel to hear him, and that's found in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, Matthew 17, verse 5, and Acts 7, verse 37. That, quote, prophet was Jesus. And in John 2, Jesus performed his first sign, which itself pointed back to the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt. Okay, and that famous verse there, Deuteronomy 18, 15, Instead, he will send you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you are to obey him. I wonder who inspired Moses to write that? And that word is Shema, means listen. Yeah, but my question, who do you suppose inspired Well, I, if, if, you know, if Moses is writing the creation of Earth who he, what, where he wasn't there, yeah. he's been instructed on all kinds of things about how the Earth came into existence. So Jesus probably inspired... <laughs> Jesus is the one that inspired Moses yeah. to, uh, to write, write about himself. <laughs> yeah, about what's coming, when he himself is going to come. At what point did Jesus know these are all yes. what I told them. I told them all this Old Testament stuff. I gave it to them. Age 12. <laughs> Age 12? Well, there's a well, growing, a growing well, awareness. So. <laughs> yeah. a significant part he knew by then. Yeah. yeah. And the question is, how did he learn all that? And well, Ellen White says quite a bit about it at his mother's knee. Yeah. And normally women in those days had no education. But they read even. So... And it wasn't even their native language. They spoke Aramaic, but the writing was in Hebrew. So, so how do you, do you think she learned? Well, I, I think she came from an from a educated family. And, um, I mean, obviously she had a, what, a cousin that's, a, or a sister that was a priest's wife. Yeah. And Instead of a photographic memory, she, what would you call it? The audib audible memory. She remembered yeah. everything that she heard on the synagogue on Sabbath, if not, if not more than that. Mm. And, and she knew this was a very special baby. She yeah. knew that. Yes. I'm sure she had times of doubt because it was pretty, that's a pretty big <laughs> pretty, thing to swallow. Yeah, exactly. But she had seen the angels. She'd heard yeah. them singing. Yeah. Okay, so perfect. Thank you. Now. One of the challenges, when the Jews talked about a prophet to come who would be like Moses, what do you think they were hoping that the Messiah would do? They'd take care of their political situation. They desperately wanted him to free them from the Romans. Okay. Well, guess, Moses freed him from the Egyptians. Why, yeah. you know? I like this. Very same similar. Situation. Very similar. Zechariah 2.10. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Yeah. I, and he's talking about himself. Yeah. Of course, Elijah, Elijah is, uh, Yahweh is God. Mm -hmm. That's what that means. Okay, I think, Lorna, you're next. Um, from Ellen G. White, the example of Christ in linking himself with the interests of humanity should be followed by all who preach his word and by all who have received the gospel of his grace. We are not to renounce social communion. We should not seclude ourselves from others. In order to reach all classes, we must meet them where they are. They will seldom seek us of their own accord. Not alone from the pulpit are the hearts of men touched by divine truth. There is another field of labor humbler it may be, but fully as promising. It is found in the home of the lowly and in the mansion of the great at the hosp hospital board. Hospitable. Hospitable board and the gatherings for innocent social enjoyment. Thank you. 
Remember that there were many miracles that took place at the time of the Exodus. Now, we're comparing Jesus now back to Moses. Mickey? The River Nile was a key resource and a deity for the Egyptians. One of the plagues was directed at the river, the changing of its waters to blood. At Cana, Jesus performed a similar miracle, but instead of turning water into blood, he turned it into wine. The water at the marriage feast came from mm -hmm. six water pots used for purification purposes in Jewish rituals, linking the miracle even more closely to biblical themes of salvation. By recounting the incident of changing the water to wine and thus referring back to the Exodus, Jesus was pointing, John no. was pointing to Jesus as our deliverer. Okay, so. so okay, so just so I'm clear, so they would use this water. They wash their feet, their hands. Yes, and anything else. We don't know. A, it, there was an elaborate way they were supposed to wash everything. If you remember Mark seven, pots and kettles and beds, even beds, had to be Sprinkling washed. Clean or, huh? or no, no, it. no. This had to be. Like we, would we think don't of washing know. Washing our sheets. Some people, because of the way the Greek is, they don't know for sure, but some people says washing your hands up to the elbow. Some people say maybe that's what it was, but it's, we don't know exactly. It was an elaborate process. Okay, so, so it wasn't just like a sprinkling, it was actually cleansing. Yeah. Okay, because of the dirt and the dust yeah. and... Well, because or, it might have been Or were they thinking it was more of a religious rite than a yes. actual cleaning, like yes. we would think of it. Yes. So, so, okay. I think it was a religious rite. Yeah. Some of the Jews still do that. The the some of my friends. Yeah. The next miracle that Jesus performed took place in the same city, that would be Cana, where Jesus had turned water into wine, but it was a healing. Okay. John 4, verses 46 to 54. Then Jesus went back to Cana in Galilee, where he then turned the water into wine. Just, just let me interrupt for just a second, just to give you a rough idea. Cana was sort of halfway between Nazareth and Capernaum. So it's, he might have been going back and forth. Yeah. And they were 25 miles apart. Roughly. A government official was there whose son was ill in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and he asked him, to go to Capernaum and heal his son, who was about to die. Jesus said to him, none of you will ever believe unless you see miracles and, and wonders. Sir, replied the official, come with me before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed Jesus' words and went. On his way home, his servants met him with the news. Your boy is going to live. He asked them what time it was when his son got better, and they answered, It was one o'clock yesterday afternoon when the fever left him. Then the father remembered that it was about that very hour that Jesus had told him, Your son will live. So he and all his family believed. This was the second miracle that Jesus before, performed after coming to Judea from Judea to Galilee. Okay, now there's something interesting about this story that probably we wouldn't notice because we're used to things happening at a distance and communicating through the air and all that kind of stuff. Jesus is in this city and 25 miles away is a boy who is sick and he says, I just made him well. I mean, to them, that was an amazing feat. How did Jesus heal the guy over there? No comment. I'm trying to diagnose what the kid had. Did he have meningitis? <laughs> Possibly. Did he have well, it uh, seemed to be that just because his, his temperature reduced, then he was all well. It was just a temperature thing because once his temperature disappeared, then he's well. well it's a, I had a seizure a or something else. Yeah. Well, but I mean, or delirious. Yeah, but it, by the mere fact that his temperature decreased then the family felt he was not going to die. So there was yeah. something fairly obvious with his temperature. Yeah. He got he, a new antibiotic. Yeah. 
It's likely that the mother of this boy was, who was healed in Capernaum was Joanna, the wife of oh. Chusa. Let me just read you this verse to make a connection. Luke 8, verse 3, Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna, many other women, used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. So we read in the other place that the whole family became followers. Well, here's this guy was a high level guy and the and the the original language there suggests that he might have been the one who specifically handled Herod's finances. Mm. So fairly high level sort of a guy. And maybe that's where she got some of the financing she used <laughs> to, to help Jesus. Who Do knows? Do you know if they were Jewish? Probably. We, we don't know for sure, I don't think. I don't know any place where it says. This was another miracle that Jesus performed, which is proof that his power was above and beyond any other person or prophet. He could speak a word in Cana, and the nobleman's son was healed many miles away in Capernaum. This was certainly way beyond the ability of the disciples or any other humans at that time to understand. In the Bible study guide, at first Jesus' response to the nobleman's plea may seem harsh, <clears throat> yet this official had made the healing of his son the criterion for believing in Jesus. Jesus read his heart and pinpointed the spiritual sickness that was more profound than his son's life-threatening illness. Like a lightning bolt from the blue sky, the man suddenly recognized that his spiritual poverty could cost the life of his son, from the Bible Study Guide for Monday. Okay, and Ellen White comments, On reaching Cana, he found a throng surrounding Jesus. With an anxious heart, he pressed through to the Savior's presence. His faith faltered when he saw only a plainly dressed man, dusty and worn with travel. And we need to sort of keep that idea in mind. This is what... I mean, this is, when Jesus went around and did all these things, this is what he looked like. He doubted that this person could do what he had come to ask of him. Yet he secured an interview with Jesus, told his errand, and, and he probably managed to do that because he was well-dressed and caught, may have arrived on a horse, who knows. Uh, you know, he was recognized by the yeah. people. Oh, there's he, Senator so-and-so. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, Told Aaron to besought the Savior to accompany him to his home, but already his sorrow was known to Jesus. Before the officer had left his home, the Savior had beheld his affliction. Okay, now how did that happen? Obviously a miracle. Okay. There's more and more evidence. I'm seeing more and more evidence that every night Jesus, in prayer with his Father, would be a, w that they reviewed in advance what was coming up the next day. Mm. And the father would say, okay, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen, so forth like that. So. In other words, statements, or Jesus was drawing that person yeah, to him. Exactly. Before we jump to conclusions, we need to remember that the devil can also perform miracles. So we don't want to say any miracle that happens. Well, that was true in Moses' time when the sorcerers, uh, when he threw his staff down and became yeah. a snake, the sorcerers did magic as well. Yeah. Even if we were to see a miracle, what other criteria must we consider before believing it is from God? Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 5, we won't take time to read that right now, <clears throat> but it tells us that we must make sure that what is... It's four lines. I'm sorry. It's four lines later. Oh, I, did, I see we did put it in here. To be, be, become a miracle as evidence of proof that God is acting, we must make sure that what is said in connection with that miracle is consistent with everything else we know about God. Jim? Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 5. Prophets or interpreters of dreams may promise a miracle or a wonder in order to lead you to worship and serve gods that you have not worshipped before. Even if, excuse me, even if what they promise comes true, do not pay any attention to them. The Lord your God use, is using them to test you, to see if you love the Lord with all your heart. Follow the Lord and honor Him with Him, obey Him and keep His commands. Worship Him and be faithful to Him. 
put put to death, excuse me, but put to death any interpreters of dreams or prophets who tell you to rebel against the Lord who has rescued you from Egypt, where you were slaves. Such people are evil and are trying to lead you away from the life that the Lord has commanded you to live. They must be put to death in order to rid yourselves of this evil. And how many times today, if you happen to listen to any religious services on Sunday mornings, that you hear someone say, well, here's a miracle, therefore you must believe what I have to say. And they're giving a bunch of nonsense. And it's good that we, we're not following every word of the Bible. We're not putting people to death. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this is a good news translation. Yeah, very forensic translation. Well, in NIV it says something very similar. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. But, but if you if you uh, get I'll an interlinear and, and use use the for example command, God doesn't command us to do anything. The, it, no. It's a it's a prescription for life. There uh, in in the New Testament would be entole. I think the Old Testament would be. Uh, uh, Mitch Volt or something. I, I could be wrong with that, but anyway, God is open. If in God, if God is the commander, why did sin begin? Yeah, for, we need to move on. We still got a lot of, for evidence. We need to, the, these questions. It seems to me they're they're important. Uh, why why is there evil was already in existence before Genesis one? Well, we know and that. Yeah, but most people don't. Yeah. There was already rebellion in heaven in Revelation 12. And that's and why, why is there rebellion? Why is it possible for people to rebel? Because God is love. Mm -hmm. People have to have... And he, he without, valued freedom. Yep. Without, exactly. Without freedom, you can't have love. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting that God, Satan felt safe to disagree with God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, that, so that's... Yeah. For so evidence, this idea that... Yeah. I mean, this idea that sin can't exist in the presence of God I don't understand That's what the point story. that people are trying to make. Well, eventually it'll have to get back to that because God will not, I mean, he can't allow things to persist after the third coming that'll just start another great controversy. If, if people are not self-controlled, you're going to have to have hierarchies, you're going to have to have a record keeping and score and people spying on others. Yeah. Well, people have to learn. And if he's going to orchestrate it, then he should have done that to begin with. Exactly. So, so that needs some unpacking, I think, on, on that. But we have all this history that God could point to. This is what happens. And so everybody will say, we don't want that anymore. I, I tell this story. It, it's a hypothesis. A million years from now, suppose that God creates a bunch of new people on a new earth somewhere, and one of them decides to rebel. And God, all he has to do is he said, he gathers all of us who've had experience with the great controversy around, he stand around, this person wants to start the great controversy all over again. What do you think I should do? Well, no, first of all, I say, sit down here, watch what happened last time someone did this. Here's the video. Here's the video. The and about after, after that's all done and the guy still wants to rebel, he gathers us all around and says, okay, you know what happened the last time someone did this, what do you think I should do? And we would just say, step back from him, just leave him alone and he'll perish. Yeah. It's, it's, and nobody will misunderstand it. And this. nobody will misunderstand, that's right. For evidence that signs, wonders, and miracles by themselves do not prove that something is from God, review Revelation 13 and 14. Just for an example, Revelation 13, Larry? Okay, Revelation 13, verse 13. Uh, the second beast performed great miracles. It made fire come down from heaven to earth, in the sight of everyone. Now these, remember, are the beasts and the images that were under the direct control of the devil. Well, next we turn to John 5, 1 to 10, the miracle of the pool of Bethesda or Bethzatha. Probably Bethzatha is correct. You want to read that for us, Lorna? After this, Jesus went to Jerusalem for a religious festival. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool with five porches. In Hebrew, it is called Bethzatha. A large crowd of sick people were lying in the porches, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. 
So now there's some verses here that are not in the oldest manuscripts, but we need to read them to help understand the context. Some manuscripts add these verses. They were waiting for the water to move because every now and then they believed an angel of the Lord went down into the pool and stirred up the water. The first sick person to go into the pool after the water was stirred up was healed from whatever disease they had. So, so it's not that that actually happened, but that was their belief. That was their belief. That's correct. Superstition. Yeah. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. Jesus saw him lying there and he knew that the man had been ill for such a long time. How did Jesus know about this man? So he asked him, do you want to get well? The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one here to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. While I am trying to get in, somebody gets there first. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Immediately the man got well. He picked up his mat and started walking. The day this happened was a Sabbath. Oh boy. So the Jewish authorities told the man who had been healed, this is a Sabbath and it is against our law for you to carry your mat. You know, that says something about the people's vision of God that they, that the, an angel would cause everybody to just fight with each other. Who could yeah. be first? Exactly. That, that's a poor vision of God. Yes, exactly. Well, and notice it when they said it is against our law. Not against God's law, not against anything in the Bible, it's against our law. Well, you'd think, I mean, this is pretty miraculous. So you'd think they'd be, wow, yeah. did you see yeah. what just happened? Rather exactly. than worried about the violation of the law. So it's, years. yeah, so whether they disbelieve it, I mean, it doesn't sound like they disbelieved it. Well, it's pretty hard to to <laughs> to disbelieve I mean, it. They, the, guy, they, they the guy's knew walking the around. The guy, right? They, yeah. they knew him. Yeah. Yeah. Try to imagine yourself in the place of that paralyzed man. He had been lying there for many years. Suddenly a stranger came up and asked if he wanted, would like to be well. I mean, how would you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think the bigger miracle is that the guy believed Jesus. So it, does, so it makes you wonder if there's more to the story. Yeah. He had heard or was rumors. it really? Okay, Mickey, I think you're the next one there. <clears throat> Jesus does not ask the sufferer to exercise faith in him. He simply says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. But the man's faith takes hold upon that word. Every nerve and muscle thrills with new life, and healthful action comes to his crippled limbs. Without question, he sets his will to obey the command of Christ and all his muscles respond to his will. Springing to his feet, he finds himself an active man. Jesus had given this disabled man no assurance of divine help. The man might have stopped to doubt and lost his chance of healing. But he believed Christ's word, and in acting upon it, he received strength. So it's putting your feet in the Water. The water, and then it happens. And so this recurrent theme of you have to start, and then you're given the strength and ability. Through the same faith, we may receive spiritual healing. By sin, our selfishness, we have been severed from the life of God. Our souls are palsied. Of ourselves, we are no more capable of living a holy life than was the impotent man capable of walking. There are many who realize their helplessness and are discouraged by it, and who long for that spiritual life which will bring them into harmony with God. They are vainly striving to, striving to obtain it. In despair they cry, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Let these desponding, struggling ones look up. The Savior is bending over the purchase of his blood, saying with inexpressible tenderness and pity, Wilt thou be made whole? He bids you arise in health and peace. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole. Believe his word, 
and it will be fulfilled. Put your will on the side of Christ. So that's a work right there. Mm -hmm. You have to choose. Will to serve him. And in acting upon his word, you will receive strength. Whatever may be the evil practice, the master passion, which through long indulgence binds both soul and body, Christ is able and longs to deliver. He will impart life to the soul that is dead in trespasses. He will set free the captive that is held by weakness and misfortune and the chains of sin. Okay, now we are had a lot of good discussion. We are running out of material. I mean, we are still a lot of material covered. What is the relationship between sickness and sin? Well, obviously... It's the same thing. Well, sin is the separation from God. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Sickness, obviously, all of it, sickness, disease, death, all those things result, have resulted from the original sin, but they believe that a specific sin had caused this specific disease, and therefore you had to be forgiven of that specific uh, sin in order to, or, or have it taken care of somehow before you could be well. It is interesting to notice that John, writing many years later, took nine or ten verses to describe this miracle. However, he took forty verses to describe the one who performed the miracle. Clearly, this is consistent with John's overall goal to teach us the truth about Jesus. So it's not just, okay, here's what happened. In Mark, that's what we get, a short book, here's the miracles, draw your own conclusions. But John, no, I want you to know what you should learn from this. Well, this to me, requires a fair amount of unpacking, so, so yeah. not that we have to do it now, but yeah. it's, it's, I mean, the whole idea of um, the metaphor of addiction, you know, having a hold on you, and, and you yeah. try, and you can't change it, and so you have to, this idea of letting go, and surrender, uh, and um, s surrendering to a higher power, so there's a lot of parallels there on, on, on a practical basis, I think, that we can benefit from of how to, so discouragement, despair, uh, all that impacts our mm -hmm. ability to believe that change is possible, so then we yeah. just give up and right. so forth and so on. So there's a lot of crossovers between addictive disease and the, the, the disease of selfishness, yeah. which we shortcut as a term of sin. What was the result among the religious leaders as of this miracle? They wanted to kill Jesus. They were angry. They wanted to kill Jesus. Did Jesus know about these rules of theirs? Of course he did. This was an opportunity for him to challenge those nonsensical rules. And Jesus was demonstrating that he was following biblical principles more than they were. Well, so it's, it's sort of a leap. Why would they want to kill Jesus? Well, because he was breaking up their their organization, their, he was challenging them. He was, he was getting more followers than they had. This is a terrible thing. He was breaking the rules. Like Caiaphas says, if the world find, uh, finds out about him, if they start to follow him, we're going to be out of a job. Yeah. Uh, the hierarchies are very important to those that are involved in it. Is it okay for Jesus to perform miracles and do other kinds of work on the Sabbath? Was it all right for him directly? Working on the Sabbath. Yeah. Was it all right for him to directly challenge their man-made rules? He was going by his rules. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, another miracle that we know about is found in John 9. We're not going to take time to read the whole thing right now, about the man that was born blind, and he's been blind all his life. And the disciples asked Jesus, well, whose fault is this, his, his sin or his parents' sin? Well, that, that seems like an odd comment say, if the person is born blind, how can it be his fault? Yeah, exactly. It, it seems like a stupid question. <laughs> yeah. So it must be his parents' fault. Well, but they said his own or his parents. Yeah. So why even bring in the word his own yeah. if he was born at yeah. birth, uh, blind at birth? Obviously, they couldn't. And then, of course, that leads us to ask the question, did God make him blind from birth so that he could perform this miracle on him? No. Sin. Well, Paul oh, addresses on. that concept, um, not that it would never apply, but this, should sin abound so that grace must more abound? May that God more. perish the thought. Mm -hmm. The b human body 
decays, it goes to but, corruption, but this, and they end up dead. That's because of sin. So this huh? happened before so, he was born. So there, it's ultimately it's true that sin causes disease. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but whether it was you or it was, it's collective selfishness, collective disobedience. I think that does have an ultimate impact. Disobedience I mean uh, um, unwillingness to listen and take instruction. Well, Not we a know command. That, you know that there was a big, big discussion about this, about the rules, and about, and and the the, the end of it was is that the Pharisees themselves were split. Some people said this guy can't be from God because he broke the Sabbath rule, and the other guy says, "Hold on a minute. You mean a sinner causes blind this blind man who's been blind from birth to be able to see?" <laughs> There's got to be some problem so with that theory. It's you thinking rationally rather yeah. than just using human rules. Yeah. Later, John told us that there were many other things that Jesus did that did not get written down. Why does he focus on miracles done on the Sabbath? This was a direct irritation to the Pharisees. Of course, by the time John was writing, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were no longer a force among the Jewish people. Another miracle that Jesus performed on the Sabbath was recorded in Matthew 12. We know about the man who Jesus asked him to reach forth, his, stretch forth his hand, and it was healed. Um, again, clearly, he did that. He didn't have to do that on the Sabbath, but he did. That, and that hand was was paralyzed his whole mm, life, or mm, for many years. To, at least. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, how could these religious leaders be so blind? How could they be so opposed to Jesus? Was it just envy, uh, jealousy? Uh, it's probably like, uh, like most, it's all of the above, right? Yeah. So yeah. misinterpretations, um, operating out of a wrong paradigm, and Jesus, um, jealousy. Yeah. And they're focusing on tradition rather than scripture. Yeah. And Jesus, ends this discussion by saying, look, I'm just doing what the Father has told me to do. I work in cooperation with him. R listen to what I tell you from the Bible. Um, Je Jesus was almost constantly at war with the religious leaders and were continually trying to defend the man-made rules. As we have already suggested, um, the Gospel of John, Jesus is constantly at war with them. I'm sorry time to close. Yeah. Our loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of discussing these important details from the Gospel of John. Guide us as we think about these things and as we figure out how we can apply them in our times and in our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.